Hey everybody, how you doing? Good, doing good. Good, it's good to see you all. Good to see all your happy faces. Hey, the, so the plan for today is to take a break from Ecclesiastes. Um, oh, oh, I felt like being real sad after church today, sorry. Uh, we're going to take a break from that series and get into this, what the scriptures teach about baptism. Because when I'm done, we're going to do some baptizing. Um, and we're going we're gonna to invite you to come down and get in the water today if you would like. Anybody would like to. You do not have to go through a class. You do not have to sign up. We have some towels and changes of clothes for you. If you are ready to step into that and follow Jesus, open invite today, okay? Um, after I'm done. You can't just go jump in there. But, but maybe there are some questions. Like, wh- like for starters, what is baptism? What's the point? What actually happens in the waters of baptism? Uh, let's begin in Matthew 28. Let's look at how Matthew kind of frames the end of Jesus' story. Look at 28:16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, the word disciple, uh, there's no kind of word equivalent for disciple in English. Uh, The closest word we probably have is apprentice, really. The concept of a disciple or an apprentice comes right out of first century Jewish culture, where where disciples would follow around a rabbi all over Israel, learn his theology, his teachings, learn how he reads the Torah, copy him and mimic him and shadow him. And then in time, carry on his teachings into the world. Jesus is looking for disciples, for apprentices, for people not only to believe, which is a great starting point, but to follow, to live as disciples, to apprentice, to learn from Jesus, to follow Jesus and emulate him, and in time, carry on and live out his teaching, his way in the world. And Jesus says this is what his followers are to do, make disciples. Well, the question becomes, how? He answers. He goes on. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And after that, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So two things about how we make disciples. First off, notice, starts with baptism. That is like how the entire journey of following Jesus Jump starts. You step into the waters, and that sparks your life as a disciple. But notice next, he says, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. What does that mean, that phrase, in the name? And well, that shows up all over the New Testament. Let's turn over to Acts. In Acts, an amazing event goes down. The Spirit of God falls on the early Jesus followers in Jerusalem. The entire city looks in an awe and wonder what's going on. And out of that, Peter, one of the disciples, stands up and preaches the gospel. The good news that Jesus is Lord, that the crucified rabbi from Nazareth is now the king of the entire world, that his kingdom is here and his kingdom is coming in fullness, and one day he will return to put the world right. And you will either enter into that kingdom as sons and daughters of God, or you'll be shut out. And you can, by faith, be saved and step into that kingdom, not only in the future, but here now, today. Peter preaches that, the gospel, and look what happens, Acts 2, 37. It says, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God, and be what? Baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how you respond to the, the gospel. You step into the waters of baptism. You go under the waters, and in doing so, express your confession, your repentance, and your faith in Jesus. Look, at, look how he says that. He says, repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, what's that mean, that, that in the name? So on one level, it simply means into the name of Jesus and not some other would-be deity, right? You're saying, listen, I follow Jesus. He's my king. He's my God. He's the one I follow. But on another level, there's a far deeper meaning to that phrase. Into the name of. It also means into the sphere or the reality of Jesus. The idea in theology is called union. 
So that's kind of a technical term used by theologians for what happens when we are saved. And that is that at that moment you are saved, you are made one with Jesus. That you are in Christ or in the sphere of Jesus. When that happens, the the union of salvation, at that moment, in time, everything that is true of Jesus becomes true of you. So Jesus' perfect access to God, his righteousness, his blamelessness, if it's true of Jesus, it's true of you. And Peter says, repent and be baptized, submerged under the water, into the name of, or into the sphere of Jesus, where you get union. You are one with Jesus. And look at what happens out of that. He says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. So anybody, no matter your background, no matter where you're from, no matter how screwed up you think you are, or you think your story may be, Peter says, when you are baptized in the name of Jesus, Made one with Jesus. Everything that is true of Jesus becomes true of you, and you get a double promise. One, the forgiveness of sins, and two, the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when you are baptized into the name of Jesus. You get forgiveness, your sins are washed away, you're made right with God, and you receive the Holy Spirit, the living, active, dynamic presence of the Creator. The Spirit of God moves into your being, into the deepest parts of your DNA. That happens, Peter says, when you step into the waters. Which is why verse 40 says, Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, Save yourself from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Now, Acts 2 is a really kind of a problem for theologians in, in all sorts of other passages like Acts 2, because... It really raises all kinds of questions. Like, what, so what does that mean? Does that mean baptism saves you? Does that mean you need to be baptized in order to be saved? And for hundreds of years, men and women who love the scriptures have been back and forth. And one side says, like, baptism is only a symbol. Nothing actually happens in the waters. It's only kind of, and the phrase is, an outward sign of an inward reality, right? It's only symbolic. Well, okay, then. That... That can, can, that can like turn real quickly into a, a religious ritual then, right? It's a, to a cold, mechanical, empty act of obedience, and really nothing more. Now, the other side says, no, you're saved by grace through faith. You're saved through, by the gospel of Jesus. But baptism is not only a symbol. It is an action. Something actually happens in the water. Well, But the problem with that side is this slippery slope into, hey, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. And I would argue... The truth is somewhere in the middle. Baptism is a symbolic act, meaning, yes, it's symbolic, hands down, absolutely. But at the same time, as it is a symbolic act, it's not an empty external religious ritual. Something actually happens when you go under the waters and you come back out. So the best analogy I can think of is my wedding day. You married couples remember, you get to know each other, you get into a relationship, You fall in love. That's like the first 24 hours. Uh, (laughs) You marry couples. Like, how many of it was like love at first sight for you? Okay, not many. Uh, Okay, like, how many of you, what is now your spouse, they're kind of like they kind of had to grow on you a little bit? Okay. (laughs) How many are you just finding out you had to grow on your spouse? All right. So and you start this relationship, you, you kind of fall in love, but eventually you get to a point in your relationship, you married couples know when you're ready to say, I'm with you for the rest of my life. And guys, you get down on one knee, you hold out that ring you cannot afford, and you say, will you marry me? But is that the end of the story? No. What really matters is what happens on the wedding day. And the wedding day is a symbolic act, like baptism. It's symbolic. The ring is symbolic. The white is symbolic, all of that. But it's an act. Something actually happened. You stand up in front of all your friends and family, in front of God, the creator of the universe, and you make vows. You sign legal documents. You get tax write-offs for the glory of God. It's It's symbolic, yes, but it's an act. Something actually happens. I would argue baptism is 
to your relationship with Jesus what the wedding is to your relationship with your spouse. And those of you for, who in a minute will come forward and follow Jesus into the waters, remember today. Write today down. Never forget. August 6th, 2023. The day you are baptized into the name of, into the reality of Jesus. Okay, so we're saying that baptism is a symbolic act. What does it symbolize? So turn to Colossians really fast, Colossians 2. Here Paul kind of explains and unpacks what all happens in the waters of baptism. Colossians 2, 9. He says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. So you do not get a more blatant statement than that to the divinity of Jesus. But if you think that's crazy, look at what he says next. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. Holy cow. Not only in Jesus all the deity dwells, okay, but in Jesus, in Christ, you and I have been brought to fullness. We have been brought into union with God. And that, by the way, that name in Christ is Paul's favorite name for followers of Jesus. He never once uses the name Christian. He never once calls you and me Jesus followers. Paul's favorite name for people like you and me who follow Jesus is those who are in Christ. And he goes on and he says, He, Jesus, is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Notice what he says. He says that baptism is the symbol of death burial, and resurrection. You go under the waters. Now, we're not going to hold you under there. Don't be scared. It's symbolic. But you go under, that's death. And you come back out, that's a symbol or a metaphor for resurrection. And Paul goes on and kind of hones in. He says, says, you've been buried and raised with Jesus in baptism. What's that mean? Look at 13. When you're dead in your sins and in, your, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So Paul here is playing with the imagery of a first century Roman prison. In Paul's day, debts were a serious problem. If you could not pay back your debts, it was a serious offense. And you were put into a Roman prison. Nothing like the prisons today. And on the cells, the guards would condemn you. They would put a legal charge, a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper was your debts. And the penalty for your debts. Death, or the cross, or years in prison, or slavery for your sons, or your daughters, or your family. Fill in the blank. The imagery that Paul uses is that Jesus goes into the prison where you and I were, and he takes that legal notice on the cell with all your debts, all your failures, all your mistakes, all your past sins, and he takes them and he nails them to the cross. And he pays your debts. He takes the penalty, the sentence for your sins, your failures, your mistakes. He takes all that on himself when he hangs on the cross. And in doing so, the door of your cell unlocks, and you get to walk out free. No more debts, no more sins, no more anything that condemns you. You're free. The point being, when you are baptized into Jesus, you get a new identity. The old you, the failures, the sins, your mistakes, that legal charge, Jesus has taken it away. The sins you have done, the failures, the adultery, the abortion, the lies, the deceit, your failure as a parent, the broken family, whatever. Fill in a blank. It's all gone. The sin's done to you. The abuse, the rape, the betrayal, the divorce, the incest, the infidelity, the broken lives, broken lives, the demonic powers at work in your life. It's all, and I quote, taken away and it's buried. The water's right there. That is, in a way, your coffin. Not to creep you out. 
But your sins, the old you, your failures, your past, it goes in there and it dies. And it gets buried. And it's all, I quote, washed away in the waters of baptism. And when you come back out, Paul says, you are a new creation. Paul goes on to say, the old you is gone, the new has come. That old identity, it has been buried with Jesus in baptism. It has been swallowed up. And you are now in Christ, in the sphere of God. Everything is true of Jesus, now true of you. You stand and live and breathe in the love of the, in the favor of the living God. You get a new identity. Romans 6, 4 says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You get a new life. Resurrection life. You get a new way to live. You get a new pattern, a new template for how to move through the world. He goes on. Look at five. It says, For if we have been united with him, so there's our idea of union, and a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So much here, but look at that one phrase. Paul says the old self was crucified with him. That the old self, the old way to be human, that is gone, that is taken away. You now, now have a new self. You have a new way to be human. You have a new way to live. When you step into the waters and you start to follow Jesus, you alter your entire trajectory. Look at eight. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died for sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Paul's point is to live up then to who you really are. That's how Paul's logic works all through the New Testament. It's the opposite of religion. Religion says, listen, okay, here's how you need to live. Here's how you need to behave. Get your ducks in a row. And when you're good enough, then you'll get into God's good graces. But the gospel works the other way around. It says, no, that's all backwards. The gospel is God comes to you in Jesus. He rescues you. He saves you. And at that moment that you're saved, you are made right with God. And now then, God says, now live up to who you really are. That's why the popular phrase that you all know, uh, sinner saved by grace, not a phrase I like. In fact, I kind of hate it. Just a sinner saved by grace. I hear that all the time. I get what people mean by that. You say, hey, I'm not perfect, I'm broken, blah, blah, blah. Did you know that not only is that phrase not in the Bible, but the only people that the Bible calls sinners are people in outright flagrant hatred of God, right? Enemies under God's wrath. The Bible never once calls followers of Jesus sinners. Not once. So I don't think we should be calling ourselves sinners. Now we sin. Don't get me wrong. I know you. You sin. But in Christ, we are called saints. Holy ones. We're called sanctified or set apart. We're called holy, blameless, pure, adopted sons, adopted daughters, royalty, priests. That's the short list, by the way. What Paul says is, listen, here's who you really are, your real new identity. Now go live up to that. You are holy. Go live holy. You are pure. Stop messing around. You are blameless. Go live blameless. Again, my wedding. I remember that day. I was a 23-year-old dum-dum. Uh, but I was a husband. Did I know anything about being a husband? No. Ask my wife. Absolutely not. But I was a husband. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life living up to what I already, what is already true of me. Paul says, you sons, you daughters, you're holy. You're blameless, you're saved, you're pure. Now live that way. Don't go back to the old ways. Live the new way. Live the way of Jesus. 
Turn over to Galatians chapter 2. One more thought, then we'll do some, get some baptisms in here. Galatians chapter 2. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3.26. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He says that the primary metaphor for baptism in Paul's day that we don't really get because we come out of very like hyper-individualistic West but in Paul's day, baptism was understood as the transfer from one family to another family. Other cultures, other religions get that way better than people like you and me. I think of like ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel. When a member of that family is baptized into the name of Jesus, they hold a funeral service. And they are put out as a dead member of the family. When people from a kind of a Islamic fundamentalist families are baptized into Jesus, if it's of the militant variety, the, the father and son will go after him or her and murder them. Because people from other cultures get, when you step into the waters, you're stepping into a new family. So, when you're baptized into Jesus, you get not only a new identity, not only a new life, but you get a new family. You become part of God's family. That's one of the reasons you have to get baptized. You don't baptize yourself, right? If anybody would try it, it's Americans who try to baptize ourselves. You have to get baptized. It does not have to be by a priest. does not have to be by a pastor. As long as he or she is a Jesus follower, you're good. But it's something that is done to you. Why? As a sign that you're stepping into a family. And maybe you're here and you feel like you're alone. Or you feel like you're out of place. You do not have to. Because the moment you step into the waters... There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, neither Republican or Democrat, or urban or suburban, or white collar or blue collar. You fill in the blank. You're all just wet. <laughs> and you're a part of a family. A family of disciples that loves Jesus, which spans the globe. We do not follow Jesus by ourselves. We follow Jesus together. So when you step into the family, when you are baptized into the name of Jesus, you get a new identity, yes. Yeah. You get a new way of life, absolutely. And you get a new family. Praise God. But that's not even the end of the story. Because now, you are now called to live as conduits for God to work through you. That means you get a whole new reason for living. You get a new identity, you get a new life, you get a new family, and you get a new mission. You get a new reason to wake up in the morning. No longer for your agendas, your desires, but now for the agenda of God to rescue and redeem the world. And that's the story that you and I are now swallowed up in, into by the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, all that said, here's the plan. We're going to open up the waters. Maybe you're here and you have yet to respond to the gospel. You have yet to repent of your sin. Uh, there's no better way to respond to the gospel than to pray, confess, put your faith in Jesus, and get into the waters of baptism. And in that moment, to receive the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit. To connect with the living God. The invitation for you is to come down and trust that Jesus is Lord. And that his love for you is real and tangible. And to follow Jesus. And in a minute, I'm going to open that up and invite you down. Uh, maybe you're here and you are saved. I'm right with God, I believe in Jesus, in the story or the gospel, or the gospel of Jesus, um, but you're really not a disciple of Jesus, right? There's a difference between a believer and a disciple. I'm not talking about salvation, I'm talking about life. The invitation for you is, hey, today's the day, stop messing around, come down, get baptized, follow Jesus, be a disciple. Maybe you're here and you're like, no, I am saved. Uh, I'm not only a believer, but I'm a follower. I love Jesus. I follow Jesus. I have for a long time, but you have not been baptized. And the invitation for you is to get baptized. Follow Jesus in that way. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel shame. Don't feel like people are looking down on you. Like, holy cow, all we do here is celebrate the stories of God's work in people's lives. Come forward. Follow Jesus in that way. 
maybe you're here and you came from a, a Catholic background or a Lutheran tradition or kind of a mainline Protestant tradition where you're baptized as an infant. And, and I want to be really careful. I don't want to be say anything rude at all. But think about that for a minute. I think you would agree that it was maybe not a conscious decision on your part. Infant baptism is a, is a nice religious ceremony. Nothing wrong with that. But biblical baptism happens when you're old enough to understand the gospel and respond to it. And what, happens to you when, what happened to you when you were an infant, it was a beautiful moving ceremony for your family. God was there and present and happy in that moment. But he invites you to come forward and be baptized as a conscious decision. The invitation is open. Come and repent and be baptized. Those who are scheduled to be baptized today and those who want to come to get baptized today, come on down. we got towels and dry clothes you can wear home. We'll figure that all out. Just come. For the rest of us who say, listen, I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. I follow Jesus. I've already been baptized. We're a family. And when somebody in our family gets married, you go to the wedding. So today, your job is to celebrate with your new family. And if someone is soaking wet and wants a hug after they're baptized, you have to hug them back. That's the rule. Okay. You can't avoid it. Okay. Good. Good to go.